What is an individual? When we claim to be individuals, what is the kind of entity we are referring to? Some say that the essence of individuality is to be a unique one, a singular, sovereign, and self-contained unity that is identical to itself. One of the challenges to this sort of definition of individuality is that our real experience of being an individual involves the presence of contradictory impulses and desires within our body. The existence of conflicting forces within seems to betray the idea that to be an individual is to be structured as an indivisible unity. Now, what does it mean to be a contradictory unity of impulses? Consider those moments in our lives, for example, in which we attempt to commit to a new goal, such as going to the gym, learning a new language, or kicking a bad habit. Almost as soon as we establish new targets for ourselves, we feel the tug of our old habits trying to drag us back to more familiar territory. Or for those of us who grew up in traditional environments with strict moral prohibitions against certain vices, transgressing the boundaries set by our family or our community may in fact awaken new desires. Such challenges to established values might arouse within us existential dilemmas about who we really are or what principles define us. These tensions tend to motivate a perception that we are fragmented or divided against ourselves. In short, rather than our individuality seeming like a self-contained unity, it is as if who we are, our bodies, comprise an ensemble of different forces, various impulses that vie for supremacy and a kind of combat. The forces victorious in this struggle manifest as various affective states or behaviors that we then identify with our individuality. Artist, writer, and philosopher Pierre Klosowski offers a series of concepts which not only serve to address the problem of the contradictory unity, but Klosowski's work also broke new ground in the research area of political economy. His writings introduced to us a new basis to think the relationship between desire, politics, and the social field in what some philosophers today call libidinal economics. Throughout Klosowski's corpus of theoretical and literary works, the concept of impulses or impulsional forces remains a central idea. Klosowski's view of impulsional forces in part derives influence from theories of the soul, familiar to early Christian mystics and heretical theologies of figures such as Meister Eckhart and Teresa of Avila. The general view Klosowski adopts is that the soul does not consist of the determinations which make it transparent through forms of interpretation or signification. The image of the soul is, in a word, imageless. As suggested at the top of the video, Klosowski's conception of the soul observes the free play of impulsional forces in a state of constant struggle with one another. The activity of the soul is constant building up and breaking down of the self, or what Klosowski calls the supo. The fluctuations of the soul only become intelligible to the supo when they are translated into images or forms of discourse. The problem is that these translations ultimately betray the incommunicable character of the soul in their various ways of becoming transparent, such as in the form of fine art creative writing, or even theoretical concepts. Determined expressions of impulsional forces, or what Klosowski calls simulacra, can only intimate outlines, aspects, or contours of the complex set of forces at work in the individual and in the cosmos more broadly. As Klosowski continues to develop his theory of impulses, he eventually strays from theology and moves his theoretical investigation to the material body in its worldly imminence. The shift from impulsional theology to an impulsional materialism involves a radical reframing of the original theological question. If we are to undertake a materialist investigation of all those desires, instincts, and drives that make up our individual subjectivity, we better also have a comprehensive account of how larger socio-political and cosmic forces bring to bear on our individual impulsional makeup. What's more, 
For Klosowski, it isn't so much that we as individuals act out impulsional forces, but that we are acted by them. He insists that impulsional forces maintain a kind of autonomy outside of our subjective viewpoint as individuals. Klosowski moreover asserts that the ebb and flow of most impulsional forces remain outside the scope of our conscious awareness. Take, for example, the numerous involuntary functions of our bodies. These functions remain largely opaque to us, except when they manifest as observable changes of some kind. Add to that the soup of mixed feelings, the onset of various cravings, and the flights of the imagination we are subjected to daily. Our bodies are veritable arenas where multiplicities of impulsional forces attempt to assert their primacy over a plethora of other contenders. This is a good point in the video to talk about Nietzsche, Nietzsche's theory of perspectivism and his general influence on Klosowski as a philosophical mediator. But before we move on, please like or subscribe wherever you are listening or watching. Often people confuse the idea of Nietzsche's perspectivism with the notion that it denotes the existential and moral perspectives of disparate individuals. What Nietzsche instead proposes is that as individuals, we are acted upon by perspectives in the passive sense. He writes that every drive is a kind of lust to rule. Each one has its perspective that it would like to compel all the other drives to accept as the norm. Returning to Klosowski's view, from the standpoint of individual consciousness, the impulses form an experience which is both singular and utterly personal. However, as we mentioned earlier, our desire to communicate our singularity is, for Klosowski, something that ultimately undermines it. When a personal picture of our impulsional makeup is articulated in language, its singularity is lost. The attempt to communicate our singularity involves the mediation of shared meanings and the filter of moral frameworks. Another reason that language is problematic is that it often fails at capturing the more ambiguous or subtle character of many of our drives. Klosowski's recognition of this impoverishment of language ultimately led him to abandon the craft of writing and turn his creative focus towards the fine arts. Finally, in Klosowski's analytic of concepts, there is another idea he uses to describe how impulses aggregate into more complex affective or emotional states, a concept he calls the phantasm. Like impulses, we experience phantasms pre-discursively. Phantasms too are unable to find total expression in simulacra or linguistic conventions. But how do phantasms differ from impulses? Well, Imagine falling in love, for example. With the impulsional theory of desire in mind, how might we explain the feeling of falling in love? And how does that feeling find a content for its expression in those with whom we fall in love? Phantasm for Klosowski denotes the coalescence of impulses into obsessional images. In the phantasmic image, we are enraptured by obsessions or longings such as falling in love. Phantasms constitute an aggregate of more turbulent flows of desire. Additionally, the spell of the phantasm creates a kind of affective image that is non-representable. Nonetheless, phantasms find a content in specific iterations of desire. For instance, over the course of a lifetime, we may fall in love more than once, and perhaps we will do so many times. Our repetition of the obsessional pattern of falling in love is likely to involve the same emotional tendencies. It will also involve familiar templates for interpersonal conflicts. Not to mention that we may find ourselves attracted to a specific type of lover and so on. For readers of psychoanalysis or archetypal psychology, it might appear that Klosowski's concept of the phantasm bears some similarities to Carl Jung or James Hillman's notion of the complex. Insofar as a complex involves recurrent fantasies populated with unconscious archetypal images. To be bewitched by a phantasm is to be caught in the repetition of an inchoate image or an imageless image. Regardless, the phantasm is an intimate image which subtly transforms over the course of one's life. In the end, 
Phantasms suffuse our relationships. They pulsate from within our internal conflicts, and they may reveal some of their hidden contours in our aesthetic portrayals of them. Thanks for listening or watching. There is, of course, so much more to say about Klosowski's theory of impulsional forces. In a subsequent video, we may discuss Klosowski's concepts of the simulacra and the stereotype. Supporting Acid Horizon on Patreon encourages such endeavors. Be sure to like and subscribe the channel, and feel free to leave a constructive comment. Okay, take care.